Chris, in trying to understand how the physical world is constructed, I'm told that quantum gravity is the holy grail, and that's the only way to integrate disparate views of the world. Quantum theory, with all of its probabilities and the absolutism of Einstein's relativity of space and time. As one of the leaders in the thinking about quantum gravity, help me through this morass. Yes, it's an interesting problem because in a sense it's unavoidable if you take the world seriously because if you think about the sort of fundamental paradigm in physics, on the one hand you have things, like electrons, positrons and so on, on the other hand you have space and time and we experience things, we encounter them in space and time. So things in space and time are you know, opposite sides as it were, but both necessary for the world as we see it to exist. Now. Einstein's theory of general relativity is the, is the, for a long time now, the accepted model for space and time at the classical level. And that talks about space and time being curved and so on. On the other hand, particles of things uh, are described by quantum mechanics. Now, you can just say, fine, <laughs> um, if you're in the presence of a gravitational field, so the space and time is curved, okay, you still just do quantum physics. However, uh, as a physicist, it's very unsatisfactory. Indeed, it might not even work. Uh, and so it's almost inevitable and is driven to the desire to bring objects and space and time together as an overarching structure. Mm -hmm. And that really is the underlying metaphysical problem of quantum gravity. Um, from a scientific point of view, uh, the problem is that when you try and do it, it falls to pieces almost instantly. And, uh, <laughs> Why? Why does it fall to pieces? What, what's the... Well, going back to... I mean, this started about 60, 70 years ago, actually. Um, but going back to, say, 19... 1890, that's sort of, even earlier, 1960, 70 maybe, a long time ago now, um, people worked on the assumption that you could take general relativity, as it is, and you, you could apply quantum theory to it, just in the way, same way that we apply um, quantum theory to the theory of the atom. Okay? So do the same thing. Now, that works for electromagnetism, if you apply quantum mechanics to the electromagnetic field, it's great, you get photons, and they're very useful things, photons these days. Uh, so we could maybe get gravitons, which might be useful. Her, when you try and do it, the mathematics totally breaks down. Um, you get uncontrollable infinities. Uh, it just gets nonsense out of the mathematics, and you cannot control them. So clearly there's something fundamentally going wrong. And that's why, from a scientific point of view, um, quantum gravity is such a fascinating subject. Even if you're not interested in philosophy at all, mm -hmm. it's still a fascinating subject as a scientist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's really the background of the problem. Mm -hmm. So how have you attacked that problem? Well, when I started my research in quantum gravity, I was very attracted to this so-called canonical view that was prevalent in those days. And very distinguished people worked on this, including the Nobel laureate Paul Dirac and people like that. Mm. So, you know, this was not trivial stuff. Um, I was very interested in this idea of how could you actually sensibly combine quantum physics and space and time. But my interest wasn't only how you it technically. I also was very intrigued by the apparent contradiction between the metaphysical structure of quantum physics and the metaphysical structure of general relativity. And that's a clear contradiction there. Mm. And that's a really interesting question. So any theory that does emerge is going to somehow have to reconcile these two things. Mm -hmm. uh, and that always intrigued me. That's how I started. So for about the first 30 years of my career, I worked a lot on this sort of subject, particularly what's called the problem of time. Um, and that problem of time is if you do try to combine general relativity and quantum mechanics, um, you find that time disappears. Very bad. It's actually true. Uh, time is somehow no longer in the formalism. So you have to obviously recover time in some way, and that's called the problem of time. And that's true to be, proved to be very, very elusive, actually. Mm. However, even more serious is this problem that you, these uncontrollable infinities. And there have been some very intriguing developments. Um, 20 years ago, Abay Ashtakar, a very distinguished uh, American physicist, produced a way of looking about this, Luke quantum gravity. Uh, only, it wasn't called that, Ashtagar variables, when Lee Smolin and Carlo Rovelli turned that into loop quantum gravity. That's become a, a big research field. So that's one approach, and I was interested in that. And the other big approach is string theory, mm. which I've never worked in formally, although I know, it's obviously it's an important subject. So I worked a lot on this so-called canonical approach. But in the end, I got very unsatisfied with this, but I felt actually it's not going to work, if I'm honest with myself. Uh, these infinities are not going to work. And indeed, if you look at the research that's been done, but about 15 years ago, it started to change from being solid, real solid mathematical work to really a bit waffly speculation. <laughs> and I'm not so keen on that, actually. I take philosophy seriously, not just waffle. That's why I turned my attention to the foundations of quantum mechanics itself, because I like Roger Penrose, a very distinguished British physicist. I think it's quite possible that quantum mechanics 
has to be changed in itself before we can bring in general relativity. Mm. That's not the assumption, incidentally, of all of the other research programs. Uh, both loop quantum gravity and string theory assume, essentially, you can use bog standard quantum mechanics. And I think that may be a fundamental error. Mm. That's why I switched my attention. Mm. So um, <clears throat> you've developed something called topos theory uh, <laughs> to apply to this subject. Uh, how would that work for uh, someone who is not entirely familiar with the mathematics? <laughs> the problem is that my all my, all my colleagues um, around the world, really, uh, are not, just, not, just not entirely familiar, not familiar at all. <laughs> it's a very difficult subject to explain. Um, Topos theory, as a branch of mathematics, wasn't, of course, invented by me. Right, right. That came, emerged in about 1965. Um, I mean, broadly, you could look at it many different ways. What first interested me is that it gave it the possibility of producing mathematical models of space and time, which you would never have thought about mm -hmm. if you were doing ordinary theoretical physics. Mm -hmm. That intrigued me. When I opened the book on the subject and started reading my top of the theory, but, but page 32, I was suddenly hit with one of these very rare eureka moments. I thought, oh my goodness, actually, this is quantum theory. You see, in top of the theory, there's extraordinary possibility. You may have propositions about mathematics that are partly true. Now, of course, in Hawking maths, that's not obviously, I have a sudden true or false. But even better, you can have things that partially exist. I thought, wow, it's quantum mechanics, you see. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's exactly what we've got with Schrodinger's cat, partially. So I thought there must partially be some, dead, partially absolutely, alive, yeah. basically. So I thought there really must be somewhere you can link the two. Mm. And it turned out that there was. And this was really, really exciting. Now, to try and explain this in, in sort of layman's terms, yeah. if I don't be, be offensive, you know what I mean by that. Oh. Um, Topos theory gives you an alternative foundation to mathematics itself. And what we've shown is that if you ever think about quantum physics in our world, you can rewrite it in a certain topos, a different foundations for maths, where it looks like classical physics, actually. So in some strange way, you've got the same old classical reasoning, but using a different foundation for mathematics. And that's a very, very, of course, exciting possibility. Um, it means there's a possible link between the foundations of maths and foundations of physics. Uh, that's my initial interest was space and time, but also it gives you an alternative way of looking at quantum theory. So maybe, of course, a big hope, a topos theory might be useful someday in doing quantum gravity. Or oh, of course, it might not too. <laughs>